Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak. And I wanted to speak about simulation and modeling in healthcare. And you can see on this opening slide a picture of the center that we have um, in Slough, which is not far from Brunel University, London, uh, which has been given to us for three years by a property company to set up a national center for simulation and modeling. Just a note there that uh, these are my views, and uh, I'm grateful uh, to the uh, groups mentioned there for the opportunity to express them, but, but they are my views. Also, a chance to thank the sponsors and the groups involved in making this possible. So thank you very much indeed. I wanted to begin by thinking about why healthcare delivery is such a difficult topic and why it is that uh, we have repeated attempts to try and uh, make it better. And uh, to begin with, I guess there are sort of three A's that we tend to think about with healthcare. We're interested in how accessible it is. Uh, we're interested in the availability of staff and we're interested in the affordability of healthcare. And uh, typically as we make it more accessible, uh, we make it more um, uh, expensive. And, um, and as it becomes uh, more expensive, uh, it can become uh, difficult uh, to uh, ensure that everybody can come along. And in the middle of this is a challenge really around the uh, health and well-being, because we know that nations uh, that do well with, um, we know that nations that do well with, um, the, uh, with, with, with the healthcare uh, tend to uh, do um, well economically, uh, and yet they tend to end up spending a lot more money um, on their healthcare. And there are big challenges about the cost and benefits of being healthier, and there's a big health and wealth uh, debate. In the UK, the policy position is set by the five-year forward view, which was published in October uh, 2014. And uh, there are three uh, challenges that relate to the way in which the system works and two challenges related to the health and well-being agenda. So on the right-hand side, we have the question of uh, health and well-being, how you can uh, make people healthier and better overall. The question about the quality of care and the uh, access to care uh, and the efficiency of care, which as you move into the third of those little circles, uh, you're, you're talking about how much care is costing. And uh, typically, uh, we have cycles where uh, we make it more efficient and then the care seems to go down and we make it uh, a higher quality and we attend to the care and it becomes more expensive. And the challenge is really for um, the Cumberland Initiative's point of view is to try and find a way to use an industrial engineering approach to engineer out costs that go with inefficiency, variation, and all those other things, and to engineer in quality, whereby processes are scalable and they're right first time. On the left-hand side, we want to do the same thing in terms of keeping people in work. So we want to engineer out the cost of being sick and engaging with a healthcare system, and uh, in terms of the workplace, we want to engineer in flexibility and new types of jobs. Around the world, I think people realize that we're reaching a crossroads in, in healthcare. And I suppose one way of characterizing this is that in the 20th century, we experienced huge uh, successes in terms of developing the science of healthcare. Um, imaging went from almost nothing to uh, being able to probe a very, very small volumes um, at speed um, inside people's uh, bodies. Uh, the quality of the images, the uh, amount of, of imaging information just, just skyrocketed during the, the century. And the same story is true um, in pharmaceuticals, um, in diagnostics, in lots and lots of areas where we learn to do things that completely transformed our ability to uh, manage or eliminate diseases. What's clear is that we can't just carry on on that journey. There are lots and lots of challenges and one of them uh, is that although we know very uh, a lot about what we can deliver, being able to deliver it at scale is proving a real challenge. And so one possible way forward from the 21st century will be that uh, the 21st century may be characterized with the logistics uh, of care instead of the science of care. Um, there are lots and lots of other visions out there. Some people say that it will be about how well you can integrate care with, with, with social um, movements and the sort of social integration. 
Uh, other people are thinking about the fact that we may move to be more of a consumer-led uh, care um, uh, uh, society uh, around the world. And, and that's, that's a challenge. We don't know uh, what's going to happen. So there's a historical perspective that we've had this unprecedented success, and yet we've clearly reached a point where we're not sure what will happen next. We've also inherited the position that we have, the buildings that we have, the way that they're configured, uh, the way that people move from one facility to another. A lot of that is part of our historical legacy. And the question is, what is it that we want to be able to do uh, in future? And we don't start with a blank sheet of paper. We can't design from scratch. We have an inherited position. Linking back to the historical perspective, because of the unprecedented changes that we've observed um, in healthcare over the last century, people's expectations of what healthcare can do for them um, has changed, uh, particularly the baby boomers who uh, ushered in a, a new generation of sort of social interactions also have very, very high uh, expectations um, in their old age or in their older age. And so uh, people's expectations are at an all time high. People are living longer. That gives us longer to um, pick up uh, diseases, and uh, so we find ourselves, um, as particularly as, as an aging population, with more and more uh, long-term conditions to manage per person, and that creates um, a, uh, the complexity of greater need and demand also allied to greater expectations. And one of the things that I guess has really uh, intrigued me since I moved into looking at healthcare now, 18 years or so ago, I guess, is why people don't model their healthcare systems more of the time. And I just wanted to take a few minutes before uh, moving into the, um, the later stages of the talk, just to, to take you through a journey with me about my uh, perspective as I've tried to explore that. So one of the first um, significant papers that, that I put together in healthcare was one that uh, suggested that industrial process could really be used to improve uh, patient care. And one of the uh, observations that with my uh, co-authors there listed, uh, we uh, came up with was the fact that there simply weren't the accessible tools for large scale scenario modeling in healthcare. And so there was a question there about where the tools might come from. And certainly that reflects a historical position that healthcare has not traditionally modeled in a process modeling, a simulation modeling way, if you like. Second attempt to deal with this not long after I became um, an academic in 2001 and moved from the, from the world of industry uh, to the world of research was a paper trying to connect up the processes of healthcare with different types of uh, modeling and industrial uh, philosophies that are driving different ways of improving things. I guess for me, one of the discoveries that would have been uh, a very obvious thing to anybody who'd studied information systems um, uh, all their life was the connection between the process that you're trying to support and the information infrastructure that you need. And uh, so here's a, a table from that uh, paper. And uh, patient pathways were um, a big thing uh, certainly uh, towards coming in towards the end of the 90s and into the early noughties. And in many ways, discrete event simulation aligns with a lean approach to managing those pathways. So you can clock people through the different stages that they go through in healthcare. You can add um, uh, treatment. Uh, you can add diagnosis. You can clock them through on whatever time scale works. And so the idea of a longitudinal pathway, the idea of leaning those pathways out, those three things seem to go together. The, on the left-hand side, the um, uh, clinical uh, perspective. On the right-hand side, uh, an industrial philosophy that was certainly very popular then, uh, perhaps less so now uh, in, res uh, in regard to healthcare. And then the discrete event simulation being a, an approach to simulation which uh, manages both of those uh, sides of things quite well. Um, the theory of constraints are uh, all about large flows of uh, capacity, uh, aligns very well with process improvement of flows and uh, with system dynamics. And at the time, I, I posed some questions about where you might uh, fit in other bits of the puzzle. 
And uh, I haven't necessarily made a lot of progress on that, but I leave that with you as a little bit of a conundrum to return to, perhaps. I'm sorry, I've gone the wrong way. Moving on down, um, the next thing we did was we uh, ran a, a program uh, called Write uh, Research into Global Health Tools. And uh, one of the outputs that we uh, generated there was an online system supported by a guidebook to help people select the modeling techniques. So uh, they would say, uh, they would be asked a number of questions about how much money they had, uh, what sort of knowledge budget they had, what they knew about the problem, what they knew about modeling. Um, and on the basis of that, the uh, system would suggest um, a number of uh, techniques that they could use. And in this case, you can see an alignment between the user-defined problem space and the solution space that might be represented by Petri Nets. This isn't a, a magical solution. This is just saying, here are some solutions that you might like to look at or some methods that you might like to look at to solve your problem. In 2012, um, Jim Fackler from uh, Johns Hopkins and uh, Julie Hankin, who's now um, at Nottingham, uh, in the UK um, got together and um, shared a panel session on why doctors don't use simulation and modeling. And um, a couple of perspectives there really from a clinical side as to what it is that uh, we need to be doing as a modeling community to persuade um, the uh, community of doctors that this will uh, really work. Julie was much more interested in, in sort of keeping the, the discussion going between the two communities. And certainly, this has been an area where the discussion has um, been uh, sporadic, I suppose, and hasn't always uh, gone particularly well. Under the Wright project that I mentioned, uh, we discovered that uh, 90, maybe 95%, depending on how you define things, of the 30 papers a day that are published in um, healthcare OR don't even refer to a real healthcare scenario. So there's a big disconnect between these communities. And this was an attempt to get some dialogue going to draw them together. So what is it that we mean by a model? Well, a model is a shared uh, mental construct, perhaps. Um, the, it's, it's quite nice, a, a shared mental construct, because it means that um, both sides um, are able very quickly to um, share some ideas, but the difficulty is that you don't know whether you're sharing exactly the same idea. Unless you can crack my head open and have a look at exactly what I'm thinking about, you don't know whether when I use the same words, I mean exactly the same uh, structure or exactly the same uh, sequence of processes, exactly the same choreography of care, if you like. And one of the challenges is you never find that out until very late in the a day, perhaps we've been working together for two or three years, and, and then you say, oh, I thought this was going to happen, and I say, well, no, I thought this was going to happen, and you realize that you haven't got a common model. Something small and physical, this was put together by one of our final year students, um, uh, Lax Karai, and um, he wanted to look at patient flows from one building to another at the Mount Vernon Cancer Center, and so he built a model based on an internet map, and he put those little bits of electronics into each building so he could have some disks that he could use to model the way in which people might walk along those little tiled pathways from one building to another and get some idea for the uh, around the movement of patients. We're interested in stuff that's large enough to walk through. We're interested in things that are mathematical, particularly things that are a computer representation. I'm going to show um, an example of some people talking about uh, their modeling. Uh, there are a number of YouTube um, uh, pieces on the uh, internet from the Cumberland Initiative. Happy to give you um, some more of this, more data um, at the end. Um, but what we're really out to do with a model is first of all to show that it can do what it's supposed to do. So has this got the scale? Can it be done at the cost when it's working that we need it to be done at? Does it achieve the outcomes in terms of patient engagement? Has it got the resilience in terms of patients getting the same thing every time? Uh, but the other thing that you want to do is to work out, uh, using a model, what might go wrong. You want to understand the unintended consequences. And models are quite a, a low-cost way of running things under extremal conditions, um, under perhaps slightly unusual conditions, under various loading conditions to work out whether there is a challenge there or not. So let's see how 
uh, that YouTube comes across. One of the challenges in trying to solve the problems faced by the NHS is that the NHS is very, very complicated. And we've seen quite a lot these days of people trying to guess what the best next step is, uh, whether it be 24-7 uh, opening or whatever. And the difficulty with trying to handle complicated systems in that way is that our intuitive experience given up. We just don't have enough to guess everything that's going to happen. Computer-based models don't forget about what's happening. They track everything. They do it in a, a very different sort of way. And they provide us with another sort of model that we can use to predict what's going to happen as we make change. We need better ways of predicting what's going to happen when we change the system. And in modeling, we have better ways of doing it. We drew this um, incredibly complicated um, map of the system from the patient's perspective that was really a spaghetti diagram, which showed the incredible complexity of the system. That map was, was literally drawn on a piece of wallpaper. It was had post-its on it, people scribbled on it. We took it round and used it in interviews. That was then converted into a model, which actually um, could be simulated or run with data in. Um, I think one of the most interesting things was when we presented this, the whole model or the whole map to people in the system, they were horrified and kind of typical reaction was, however did we get into this mess? How did we end up with this, such a complicated system? The simulation is built on strong population analytics, strong clinical structures, strong financial structures, strong levels. That bit is taken into the thread at the end of the bonnet bit of where simulation really comes to its own is in the ability the teams to visually look at that patient journey, look at the new care models compared with the old ones and assess the benefits both in, in healthcare and financial terms of new against old. So he, uh, the, the link here gives uh, a number of people's uh, reflections on how you might use modeling to help people understand the environment in which they're working better. In July 2010, uh, a group of us got together, a group of um, academics and some people from industry initially, um, and we have gathered in clinicians and clinical managers since then with two aims. One was to transform the quality and cost of healthcare in the UK and around the world through systems thinking, and to secure significant economic stimulus by building a knowledge sector around healthcare that can feed into the economy as well as feed into the higher quality care and the greater efficiencies of care. Here is an example of a piece of modeling that was done uh, in about 2008 to 2009 and then published um, uh, after that uh, with a, um, an emergency department uh, in a district general hospital. The model runs from right to left, and you can see that people come in, in re at reception, and uh, fairly typically for a, a British uh, you, uh, emergency department, you have four uh, main sections. There's the minors, the majors, the pediatrics, and the resuscitation. And uh, you can just about make out some of the gray lines that link um, elements uh, within one circle to elements in another. And each one of those is a possible patient pathway through the emergency department. And this is a very uh, detailed uh, model. It took quite a long time, uh, particularly because we were trying to replicate one particular feature of the um, system. Here is an example of um, one of those uh, areas opened up and you are able to track a patient journey as we say, as, it get, as the patient gets clocked through the system, they will move on from one resource to uh, another resource. Uh, one of the uh, tricky elements of this was to set up the queues in such a way that we were not just allowing the queues to build up and fall, but because in the UK you have a constrained system, as people approach four hours in the system, you have to do something about it. And so the first thing you have to know is who the people are who have been in the system for approaching four hours. And so there are green people who have been in for up to three hours. Uh, there are some amber people whom you can't see because they weren't caught in this snapshot who would have been in for uh, three and a half, uh, three to three and a half hours. There are some red people who have been in from three to four hours. 
and there are some blue people who have breached the four hour limit. And the colors green, amber and red are part of the system in an emergency department in the UK. And uh, they, they signal uh, exactly those, those uh, durations that people have spent in the system. Took some data. Uh, this is several weeks of data averaged into um, uh, a single week uh, that we were able to um, feed into the model. And uh, you can see a clear diurnal pattern there. And then we ran the model. And uh, here is a snapshot of um, the, the model having been run against the uh, actual patient stays in the emergency department. And you can see that most of the time it's very, very good. Now the thing that took us a lot of time to um, analyze was this peak, which comes up at four hours because uh, normally you would have a, a distribution that would look something like that. And because there's now a rule that says you have to get people out by four hours, then there are some interventions. And so the number of people uh, go up at four hours and trying to model that and work out exactly the strategies that um, emergency uh, physicians and, and nurses were using in order to combat or to deal with the four-hour limit was took us quite a lot of time. Uh, the agreement here is perhaps quite poor. There are two reasons for that. Uh, number one, Julie, who did the modeling, um, contends that there's a certain amount of gaming here for which there is a lot of evidence. There are lots of people who are discharged exactly in four hours or in three minutes and 59 minutes, uh, three hours and 59 minutes, but there are not uh, people that are discharged in four hours and one minute or four hours and two minutes. And the whole gaming thing, there's a literature around that. And so Julie didn't spend too much time trying to get close agreement here. Um, her, her model simply records the actual time. And there are various reasons why uh, the timing around this, this thing may be difficult to record legitimately, as well as the fact that there, um, that there is evidence at, at times of, of rounding. So you can then have different discussions with different groups of people. So uh, management realize that if they go into this territory, they will be fined. Uh, there's a lot of discussion around how you manage people um, as you come up to four hours. And one of the tricky things is that you're changing your strategy from a first come first served, or sorry, from a medically, clinically prioritized uh, queue to a first come first served basis to get people out as they uh, approach the four hours. Um, and you're doing it when you don't have a lot of time uh, to think about it necessarily. And of course, any process engineer would say, well, the key thing you want to do is to design this so that the peak of the distribution is here somewhere, so that in that case, by the time you get to four hours, you're exception managing a very small number of um, patients. We have a center now, as I said, I showed the, the photograph at the start. Um, there are walkthroughs, uh, space for walkthroughs and mock-ups. There's 400 square meters that we can do a lot of stuff with to help people to think about the spaces that they work in. Um, and um, we've got space for training. Um, yesterday we spent some time uh, with um, a number of, of, of managers who are looking to, to, to manage specific uh, challenges around their uh, clinical world. And uh, we, can, we can offer different types of training uh, from soft systems and conceptual modeling all the way through to different types of simulation modeling and very um, hard numbers driven modeling as well if, if people are interested. Uh, obviously we're interested in doing some modeling at scale if we can. Um, we, uh, that's that's uh, really part of our DNA. And we're very interested in the use of um, modeling as a basis for serious gaming. So the people that are commissioning care, perhaps gaming with different strategies uh, and several suppliers of care to work out how you set up the best um, contracts. Here is an artist's impression of the uh, 400 uh, square meters there. This door leads through into some office space at two levels. Um, and then out the back here, there is a, uh, a big door that you could use for bringing ambulances and stuff um, up to. So it's a, it's a, it's a space that, that we like to do um, different things uh, with. So how are we hoping to make this work? We're hoping to find some space uh, for the uh, three critical communities for us the modeling challenge will not be solved by clinicians on their own, nor by companies on their own, nor by academics um, on their own. And one of the challenges that we face is working out how best to get those people to work together. We're creating a business model that allows us to do modeling 
and uh, various types of systems thinking, risk analysis, uh, risk stratification and stuff at varying scales uh, from a very local clinic perhaps to uh, a regional solution. We're promoting systems thinking in as many ways as we, possi as we possibly can and we're keeping the dialogue going with as many people as we possibly can. And if there's time, I thought I might just um, see, let's see if, if this uh, YouTube, uh, web, uh, sorry, if this uh, opening sequence from the Cumberland will work. This will give you a chance to see the space at the back and the way that we're um, hoping to use it. So let me see if this works out. It looks like another busy day in A&E. Patients wait to be assessed and treated. But take a closer look. This is in fact a living laboratory, a test bed that can be used to model improvements in patient waiting times. This is the first space that's been created in this country to bring together uh, real world simulations and computer based simulations aimed at improving service delivery. It's about clinicians having a, a space in which they can do stuff. What could they mock up? Um, A&E is an obvious area. Awards could be uh, mocked up. Um, theater suites would be another interesting area, how you schedule um, suites of facilities, um, specialist units, ITU and places like that. Um, but we could, we're also very interested in uh, laying it out like a geographical place, projecting maps on the floor and laying it out like Slough or like Wales or like Manchester and look at how services would be delivered across the region. This was the official opening of the Cumberland Institute. And for these clinicians and health managers, it was also a chance to take part in a computer simulated challenge. Different hospital departments playing against the clock to make emergency care decisions without breaching that all important four hour target. It was a little bit pressurised in trying to all, all do the same questions, but I think it worked really well. And the modelling came out excellent. So we did, I think we worked really well as a team. So you can see how the number of patients in A&E affects the number of patients in the assessment unit and the wards in sort of a sort of knock-on effect. Also gives you an opportunity to actually see what's going on without doing it in a real environment. So it's a very safe way of looking at how um, patient pathways work. Most people work in very complex organisations and they only see their bit of what goes on and they don't necessarily feel that they can solve all of the problems. They don't see what happens upstream or downstream of their decisions. Um, so this enables us to play out a hospital in, in a virtual environment but with real people making those sorts of decisions and understanding how they can do that differently in order to improve the flow within a hospital. And hospitals already using modelling say the Cumberland Institute now gives healthcare staff the space to interact with virtual scenarios. At the moment the way we do it is we do it on computer screens. And I think actually getting the teams in here to try it out, you will pick up lots of things that could potentially go wrong, which you can't pick up just from doing it in a virtual world. And, and our clinical teams will get a feel for what it could be like. And I think that's really important, that they actually experience a change that makes their working life better and they know it delivers better for their patients. We have very big dreams for this place. It's an opportunity to think in a very different way and to move from reactive care to predictive designed care. And that would make a huge difference. Okay, so that's... Um So where are we going next? We don't know. Um, the, it's, a, it's a voyage of discovery. Um, I like this picture because it shows how uh, difficult it is uh, to tell people where to go or where to walk. They, um, they're supposed to go off to the left here. They've all been walking this way. And uh, I thought that was a nice allegory to finish with. We're trying to make the path by walking a different way in healthcare. Thanks very much indeed for listening. Thank you, Professor Young. Thank you.